All right, I am back with day three of the crossover. Guys, I'm really enjoying this book. It's really harder than I thought to read a book um, of all poems, but we're getting through it. So, all right, today, this first poem is called The Bet, part one. All right, we're down by seven at halftime. Trouble owns our faces, but coach isn't worried. Says we haven't found our rhythm yet. Then, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, Vondi starts dancing the snake, only he looks like a seal. The coach blasts his favorite dance music, and before you know it, we're all doing the cha-cha slide. To the left, take it back now, y'all. One hop this time. Right foot, let's stomp. JB high-fives me with a familiar look. You want to bet, don't you? I ask. Yep, he says, then touches my hair. Ode to my hair. If my hair were a tree, I'd climb it. I'd kneel down beneath and enshrine it. Then I'd treat it like gold and then mine it. Each day before school, I unwind it, and right before games, I entwine it. These locks on my head, I designed it. And one last thing, if you don't mind it, that bet you just made, I decline it. The bet, part two. If I lose the bet, you want to what? If the score gets tied, he says, and if it comes down to the last shot, he says, and if I get the ball, he says, and if I don't miss, he says, I get to cut off your hair. Sure, I say, as serious as a heart attack. You can cut my locks off, but if I win the bet, you have to walk around with no pants on tomorrow in school during lunch. Vondi and the rest of the fellas laugh like hyenas. Not to be outdone, JB revises the bet. Okay, he says, how about if you lose, I cut one lock, and if you win, I will moon that nerdy group of sixth graders that sit near our table at lunch. Even though I used to be one of those nerdy sixth graders, even though I love the way I love my hair the way my dad loves Krispy Kreme, even though I don't want us to lose the game, odds are this is one of JB's legendary bets I'll win because that's a lot of ifs. The game is tied when JB's soft jumper sails tick through the air, talk. The crowd steals, tick. Mouths drop, talk. And when his last second shot, tick. Hits the net, talk. The clock stops. The gym explodes. It's hard bleachers empty and my head aches. In the locker room after the game, JB cackles like a crow. He walks up to me grinning. He holds his hand out so I can see the red scissors from Coach's desk smiling at me. Their steel, sharp, their steel blades sharp and ready. I love this game like the winter loves snow. Even though I spent the final quarter in foul trouble on the bench, JB was on fire and we won and I lost the bet. The next poem is called Cut. Time to pay up, filthy, JB says, laughing and waving the scissors in the air like a flag. My teammates gather around to salute. Filthy, 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 they chant. He opens the scissors, grabs my hair to slash a strand. I don't hear my golden lock hit the floor, but I do hear the sound of calamity when Vondi hollers, oh snap, calamity. An unexpected, undesirable event, often physically injurious. As in, if JB hadn't been acting so silly and playing around, he would have cut one lock instead of five from my head and, and avoided this calamity. As in, this huge bald patch on the side of my head is dreadful calamity. As in, the game after the game, my mom almost has a fit when she sees my hair. What a calamity, she says, shaking her head and telling Dad to take me to the barber shop Saturday to have the rest cut off. Mom doesn't like us eating out, but once a month she lets us choose our favorite restaurant. And even though she won't let them, I'm sorry, and even though she won't let him touch half the things on the buffet, it's dad's turn to choose and he chooses Chinese. I know what he really wants, it's Pollard's chicken and barbecue, but mom has banned us from that place. In the Golden Dragon, mom is still frowning at JB for messing up my hair. But mom, it was an accident, he says. Accident or not, you owe your brother an apology, she tells him. I'm sorry for cutting your filthy hair, filthy, J.B. laughs. 
Not so funny now, is it? I say, my knuckles digging in his scalp till Dad saves him from the noogie with one of his jokes. Why can't you play sports in the jungle, he asks. Mom repeats the question because Dad won't continue until somebody does. Because of the cheetahs, he snaps back, so amused he almost falls out of his chair, which causes all of us to laugh and get past my hair issue for now. I fill my plate with egg rolls and dumplings. JB asks Dad how we did. Y'all did okay, Dad says. But JB, why did you let that kid post you up? And filthy, what was up with that lazy crossover? When I was playing, we never. And while Dad is telling us another story for the hundredth time, Mom removes the salt from the table and JB goes to the buffet. He brings back three packages of duck sauce and a cup of wonton soup and hands them all to me. Dad pauses and Mom looks at JB. That was random, she says. What, isn't that what you wanted, Filthy? JB asks. And even though I never open my mouth, I say thanks, because it is. Missing. I am not a mathematician. A plus B seldom equals C. Pluses and minuses, we get along, but we're not close. I am no Pythagoras. And so each time I count the locks of hair beneath my pillow, I end up with 37 plus one tier which never adds up. The inside of mom and dad's bedroom closet is off limits. So every time JB asks me to go in there to look through dad's stuff, I say no. But today when I ask mom for a box to put my dreadlocks in, she tells me to take one of her Sunday hat boxes from the top shelf of her closet. Next to her purple hat box is dad's small silver safety box with the key in the lock and with the key in the lock and practically begging me to open it. So I do, and when unexpectedly, what are you doing, filthy? Standing in the doorway is JB with the look that says busted. Filthy, you still giving me the silent treatment? I'm so sorry about your hair, man. I owe you, filthy. So I'm gonna cut the grass for you for the rest of the year and pick up the leaves and I'll wash the cars and I'll even wash your hair. Oh, you got junk jokes, huh? I say and then grab him and give him another noogie. So what are you doing in here, Filthy? Nothing. Mom said I could use her hat box. That doesn't look like a hat box, Filthy. Let me see that, he says. And just like that, we're rummaging through a box filled with newspaper clippings about Chuck the Man Bell and torn ticket stubs and old flyers and, whoa, there it is, Filthy, JB says. And even though we've seen Dad wear it many times, actually holding his glossy championship ring in our hands, is more than magical. Let's try it on, I whisper. But JB is a step ahead, already sliding it on each of his fingers until he finds one that fits. What else is in there, JB? I ask, hoping he will realize it's my turn to wear Dad's championship ring. There's a bunch of articles about, about Dad's triple doubles, three point records, and the time he made 53 free throws in a row at the Olympic finals, he says, finally handing me the ring in an Italian article about Dad's Bellissimo cover and his million-dollar multi-year contract with the European League. We already know all that stuff, JB. Anything new or secret type stuff, I ask? And then JB pulls out a, man a manila envelope. I grab it, glance at the private stamped on the front. In the moment that I decide to put it back, JB snatches it. Let's do this, he says. I resist ready to take the purple hat box and jet. But I guess the mystery was just too much. We open it, there are two letters. The first letter reads, Chuck Bell, the Los Angeles Lakers would like to invite you to our free agent tryouts. We open the other, it states, your decision not to have surgery means that realistically, with patella tendonitis, you may not be able to play again.